In this edition of Campus Report, Justin Goodrum takes a look at a certain demographic that could have a very important impact on the general election. Also coming up as spring break approaches and air travel surely increases, Chris Bowers reports on the essential do's and don'ts of security survival when going to the airport. Plus, Jorge Hernandez reports on Albuquerque's newest high school, which promises to relieve overcrowding at West Mesa and is generating a lot of excitement for APS students. And finally, Danielle Flores finds out whatever happens to those hopeful New Year's resolutions after just a few months' time and how gyms are offering new goodies to keep you motivated. I'm Bren Boer. And I'm Marian Anderson. Welcome to Campus Report. Local coverage. Student perspectives. At the University of New Mexico. From the KNME studios, this is Campus Report. As the 2008 presidential election dominates headlines, a certain demographic wants their voice to be heard by the candidates. The youth vote has now become a major focal point in determining who will become the next president. And UNM students are spreading the word about the importance of voting. Justin Goodrum reports. When somebody thinks of spreading youth voting, a video game usually doesn't come to mind. But UNM's Black Men in Motion are using the popular sports game, Madden 2008, to lure students into signing up to vote. Black Men in Motion's Vice President, R.J. R. Britton, believes young people are more interested in this year's election because the candidates are offering a new message. It is more, more the candidates. You know, it, it is time for change now because the candidates are preaching more about change. And if you look at them, you have, you know, a black man running for president and a woman running for president. So I think that it has inspired change in a lot of young individuals. And because they want that change, a lot more young people are getting out to vote. First for youth voters looking to elect a Democratic president grow, Stephen Dinkle, president of local conservatives, wishes the other candidates would pay more attention to youth voters. They go out because you do what's called campaigning. You inspire people to listen to your message or just to go, hey, I should explore this. So I definitely think presidential or any candidates should definitely explore um, college universities. UNM's president of the College Democrats, Mercy Berman, says the youth vote determines how critical issues are going to affect them in the future. Much as we love our elders and our parents and our grandparents, we can't trust them to make choices that would be concurrent with what our needs and our wants are going to be. And so we have to make that, we have to make choices that are going to benefit our future. And so it's important for us to get out there and actually do it. And obviously in this election, we can make a difference. Oscar Lopez, a graduate of UNM, who has worked with the John Edwards campaign and is now working for the Martin Hendrick campaign, has some key advice for college students deciding whether to vote. I know some young people have outlook on politicians as they generalize them as being for themselves, but I urge them to, to look at each politician individually. For those still undecided if their vote matters, Lee Drake, Southwestern Director of College Democrats of America says the proof lies within this year's Iowa Democratic primary. Just look at, say, Iowa. You had about 20, like, it was close to 20, like 15 to 20 percent of that vote was youth, uh, defined as, eight, as 17 to 30, because in Iowa, if you're registered, able to register to vote at the general election, you can vote at the age of 17. Um, those numbers gave Barack Obama a 13% boost because they broke 57% for him. He would not have won that primary without the youth vote. This is Justin Goodrum for Campus Reports. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks for coming. Oh, thanks for having me. With this election, the youth vote is really important. What are some of the main issues that the youth should be concerned about? Uh, definitely the uh, economy is, is huge. Um, it's, it's always going to be an issue, it always has been, um, especially now with you know, subprime mortgages and people can't you know, afford um, paying for their houses and stuff like that and you have banks issuing out money to those people who can't pay to take out those loans. Um, the youth is going to have to address that because that's going to be in our hands soon. Mm -hmm. And then another big issue is definitely uh, uh, the war on terror and protect protection of uh, the United States. Because without protection, um, we don't have to worry about any of our problems because the United States won't be here. <laughs> what about health care? I read that some youths are concerned about that as well. Is that a big issue in this election, you think? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you've, you've seen it on both ends. Uh, Mitt Romney was probably the, the strongest on the uh, conservative side. Um, you know, pre-primary and stuff like that, because um, he did it in Massachusetts. He did it brilliantly with free market, no growth of government. And on the other side, Hillary Clinton and uh, Barack Obama are, you know, that's one of their big platforms. Hillary is, has probably a little bit more experience in it because of uh, her uh, um, 
chance when Bill was in office. Um, so she probably that's probably a bigger issue for her. But definitely the youth are probably looking at it as, hey, we really would like this idea. Which one is it? Which way do we go? Do we go with it in the private sector with more options that way, or do we do it with the government issuing it? So that's the issue about health care to the <laughs> youth. Both Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama have appeared on SNL. Um, Hillary Clinton was on The Daily Show. Does that help the youth vote as well? Does that show a different side of the candidates? Probably. You know, it lets them know that they're human <laughs> and um, that they can have some fun and such like that. So um, it's, uh, I don't think it will sway votes, but it, it definitely you know, makes them seem like they're not just politicians. All right, Stephen, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thanks. It's that time of year again when people leave their daily lives and head out on vacation for spring break. But for most, the airport is the first and worst stop on the list. But it doesn't always have to be. Chris Bowers reports on the essential do's and don'ts when heading to the airport. But with all the recent changes to flight policies, there's some confusion as to what plane passengers can actually take across the checkpoint. TSA baggage inspector Sims Bauer says there's no doubt about it, passengers have no idea what to pack and what to leave at home, and it's not uncommon to come across accidental illegal items. And, and, and for the most part, uh, uh, when you're going through the checkpoint, uh, you have an option. If it's not something that is illegal, some type of illegal substance or illegal item that you've got in your uh, possession, then you usually have the option to take it back and either put it in your check baggage or leave it with someone outside the checkpoint, or uh, if you have a vehicle at the airport, you can put it in there. After 9-11, flight policies changed drastically, and airports are no longer as lenient as they once were. Even Albuquerque's own Sunport underwent drastic renovations to tighten security by making it harder for unwanted people to get past the TSA checkpoint. Not to mention, items that were once okay to bring on the plane are now forbidden. So what are these forbidden items? Well, specifically, you can't take things such as firearms, uh, explosives, uh, generally speaking, sharp items, knives, uh, certain tools, uh, disabling chemicals, and things of that nature. One of the things that has come about uh, fairly in, in the recent time is the liquids and gels rules, where you can only carry on um, liquids or gels in three ounce containers or less that will fit in a one quart Ziploc baggie and you can only take one per person. There's no such thing as random searches like many think, but TSA still has the right to search suspicious luggage. Bowers stresses to read the website before heading to the airport to lower your chances of being searched. But for a more specific list of what you can't or can take onto an airplane as carry on or as into your check baggage, you can go to the uh, TSA website, it's tsa.gov, and uh, at this website you can, uh, it, it's, it, it gives you a list of information, a whole host of information that can make your traveling experience a lot easier and uh, shorten your times uh, uh, when going through the security checkpoints. As always, passengers should arrive at least one hour early, but it's unlikely to wait for more than 10 minutes at the checkpoint. Also, if you're still unsure about what not to bring, check the website. Go to tsa.gov, that's tsa.gov, and click the 311 option on the homepage for a list of guidelines for what liquids and gels are okay to bring on board. Also, if you click on the permitted and prohibited option, you'll find a complete listing of banned items to make your trip through the airport a breeze. Reporting for Campus Report, I'm Kristen Bowers. And uh, Chris Bowers is actually in the studio right now. And Chris, let's just start off. What tips do you have for anybody traveling in the near future? Well, as always, you should generally arrive at the airport at least an hour to an hour and a half ahead of time. You don't want to be rushing to get through the checkpoint and get to your terminal. Um, also, you should read the TSA website, um, as you heard in the package before, because you can have, um, excuse me, you can find lists there of things that you can and can't take on board of the airplane. So it would just, it would be a little bit easier to leave those things at home instead of having to go back to your car and take them. And what about the people that act, bring a prohibited item on board by mistake? What happens in those? instances? Um, well, I, I think it's very rare that they bring a, a prohibited item on board of the airplane. Um, if that happens, then I just assume that it stays there. <laughs> but um, 
uh, when, when going through the checkpoint and there, there is a prohibited item that the, the TSA um, officers find, uh, there's, there's several different things you can do. If it's something that's not really worth a whole lot, toothpaste, mouthwash, whatever, you can just you know, throw it away. Or you can take it back to your car, or you can have somebody who is waiting outside the checkpoint to see you off take it, or you can put it in your baggage that goes, goes under the, your check baggage mm. that goes under the airplane. What about parking? Any suggestions there? Um, for parking, I think the easiest thing to do always is to, you know, see if you can find somebody to drop you off or, you know, grab a taxi or something like that because there is parking at the airport, but it's expensive. You have to pay for it. And um, it's not always the safest thing to do. And, of course, there's always um, little parking areas around the airport that you can use, too. Well, that's great. Thank mm -hmm. you for coming by. It's a sight many people in southwest Albuquerque are seeing for the first time in over 50 years. Surfacing out of the sands of the southwest Mesa, a new high school is stirring a lot of excitement. And as reporter Jorge Hernandez tells us, a lot of controversy. One of our colleagues is calling it a school that's rising out of the Mesa, so we're very, very excited. A Trisco Heritage will be the first high school built in southwest Albuquerque in over half a century. The school is being constructed to relieve the overcrowding of nearly 3,000 students at West Mesa High School. This high school certainly is going to fit into that need um, historically as well as um, will meet the demands that the new uh, housing developments in that area um, will bring in terms of, of new students. A Trisco Heritage will offer students many opportunities and ways to advance their careers even before stepping into a college classroom. Coming in the ninth grade, we are assuming that all of them are going to go to college. We're going to put them in a college curriculum, and then if they decide not to go to college because they don't want to, or they, that's not their field or whatever, it's they still will have the preparation to do so and decide not to. Not They're not prepared to go, and they can't go. The school is located at the intersection of Senator Dennis Chavez and 118th Street. It will be on 65 acres in the Southwest Mesa and will consist of a brand new sports complex and more than 20 buildings that will individually serve as academies. It's the first of its kind in the state of New Mexico, being built with small learning communities and academies. So the way it's being built is similar to university and offering classes ranging from dozens of topics. C22 down here is going to be our filmmaking and technology academy. One of the great things we're excited about at this school is that this is going to be kind of like a little small mini university, Universal Studios in terms of how it's being built. Despite its innovation, the school isn't coming without controversy. The campus borders the South Valley, but no South Valley students are in its district. They still belong to Rio Grande. Living in the same subdivision, friends will be separated by Unser Boulevard. Unser is the divisional line between Rio Grande and Atrisco Heritage districts. That upsets middle school students like Cristina Amparan and Daniel Chavez, who thought they would both be attending Atrisco Heritage when it opens in August. It sucks. That's pretty stupid. <laughs> an APS source says that many South Valley students originally were in the new district, but Rio Grande opposed Atrisco Heritage interfering in its district. I'm a little upset that he can't go to that school. I was looking forward to that school being built so he could go there because it'd be closer to home. Definitely a hassle. Rio Grande's the opposite way of the way I need to go to work, so this would be perfect. Another dilemma facing the school is that it doesn't have its own cluster. Currently, it's taking students in West Mesa's cluster living in the boundaries of Central along Unser to Senator Dennis Chavez and stretching as far west as Rio Puerco. But the boundaries aren't stopping this parent. Any way that I can, I'll try to get him to go to that school. Karen Sanchez Griego says that there is still hope for those living near the school and wanting to be in a Trisco Jaguar. For Campus Reports, I'm Jorge Hernandez. And we have Jorge Hernandez here to tell us a little more about a, a Trisco Heritage High School. Jorge, thank you for joining me. Uh, first things first, how many students are expected to attend the school? Well, basically in the area that they took from West Mesa, there's 520 eligible students that are able to go to the school, but you know, I mean, you take into account the number of students that actually go to alternative schools or other private schools. Um, they're expecting 470 students to attend a Trisco Heritage. And uh, what's interesting about the school, it's, it's, it's not going to have all four grades at first. 
it's going to start off with the ninth grade class, and then slowly we'll just advance. The ninth graders will be tenth, then there'll be eleventh graders, and then twelfth graders. So you're expecting a graduating their first gra graduating class to be in a the 2011-2012 school year. Okay, and why is this school so important to the South Valley residents? Well, basically, it's important. They would like to attend the school because it's so close to the district. I mean, you're only divided. I mean, the the school itself is in Bernalillo County, and as most of us know, the South Valley is in Bernalillo County. It's not a part of city limits, so it angers a lot of parents that their children can't go to this school, this school that's state of the art. I mean, we're talking about a, an area of the Albuquerque metro area that the medium income is only $30,000. And a lot of students actually want to go to this school to help further their advancement uh, education-wise. So, you mean, it's going to prepare them. Uh, the principal, uh, Sanchez Grego, told me that they're expecting, they're planning for this school to be kind of like the Albuquerque Academy or the St. Pius curriculum. Okay. Um, with that said, how do you think the school is going to compete uh, athletically? Well, competing-wise, maybe not that good for the first maybe few years because they're not going to have a full school. At first, they're going to start off at 4A. And then right now, they just recently signed the junior varsity coach for Mayfield who had a really good record JV-wise. And we all know Mayfield has one of the best football programs in the state. And also, they just signed as their athletic director. They signed Mark Salas, who was, a, who was the athletic he was a wrestling coach at Rio Grande, so right now they're looking really good. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you uh, stopping by and letting us know. Thanks. Thank you. And what's the first thing people think of when they hear New Year's resolutions? For most, the thoughts of new diets and trips to the gym, they come to mind. But unfortunately, it's hard to maintain those resolutions after only a few months. But there are more options to exercising than just running on a treadmill. Danielle Flores takes us on a tour of one of Albuquerque's most popular gyms. New Mexico Sports and Wellness. The number one New Year's resolution is losing weight and getting healthy, and that usually means heading to the gym. New Mexico Sports and Wellness is Albuquerque's leading chain of fitness and sports clubs. Of the five facilities offered around the city, Del Norte's club is the largest and most popular. Del Norte's newly renovated branch offers a state-of-the-art free weights area, weight machines, two different cardio areas, and a group exercise studio. The sports and wellness clubs are known for their friendly and welcoming environments and dedicated employees, such as Robin Heimer, help contribute to that atmosphere. I work at the hospitality desk, so I take care of all the customer service and stuff, like answer phones, um, fold towels. Um, it, our job is pretty much anything and everything. All the new members that come in, everyone comes to us. All the questions that are asked, everything comes to us, and then we kind of organize everything. A variety of activities are offered at Sports and Wellness, and now, almost two full months into the new year, it is important to be informed so the resolutions stay intact and so pounds come off. Gabe Gonzalez, the member service manager at Del Norte's location, offers a description of the club's assets. Um, here at Sports and Wellness, we offer a number of amenities, um, not just working out, but we have personal training services, spa services, um, aquatics, um, basketball, basketball leagues, um, league sports, and group exercises included with the membership. Um, some of the other clubs offer um, racquetball, handball sports, tennis. Certified professional trainers assist members with one-on-one -on -one exercise sessions. Seth Wilkie, a personal trainer at Del Norte, briefly explains his job. Uh, everything from doing initial assessments with people to tell them how fit or unfit they are to designing programs and talking about lifestyle with them. According to Men's Fitness Magazine in 2007, Albuquerque was voted the number one fittest city in the United States, beating out Seattle and Colorado Springs, and not many know about it. I didn't know that. I do know that we are the number one club in the country really? right now, yeah, but I didn't know that we were voted the fittest. That's news to me. Although Albuquerque has dropped to third place this year, it still holds one of the top five fittest city spots. The fact that Del Norte Branch is open 24 hours during the week could be another result to the ranking. Monday through Friday, we're open 24 hours, and then Friday night we close at 9. Um, Saturday we open at 6 and then close at 9, and then Sunday we open at 7 and close at 9, and then Monday we're back open at 4 o'clock in the morning. Gabe states that maintaining a healthy New Year's resolution can be a struggle to hold year-round. Yeah, I'd say that that's definitely our peak season is a, during the New Year. But um, I mean, we try to keep, we try to retain our members to get, continue their membership um, through the peak season, 
and uh, some people do, but it starts to fade a little bit more around March. To stay on track to a healthy lifestyle, visit New Mexico Sports and Wellness's website at www.nmsw.com. There is no doubt the New Mexico Sports and Wellness Clubs have helped rank Albuquerque, New Mexico as one of the fittest. The 24-hour location at Del Norte has hopefully made it easier to maintain a healthy New Year's resolution, day and night, all year long. For Campus Reports, I'm Danielle Flores. So tell me something, Brent. Did you keep your New Year's resolution? You know, I'm on the Chinese New Year uh, calendar, actually, so it's in process. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, that does it for us here at Campus <laughs> Report. We'll see you next time. I'm Marian Anderson. And I'm Brent Boer. You have a good one, UNM. <laughs>